Good morning to all of my dear colleagues uh, joining us on this strange platform. It calmed my nerves a little to hear the voice of uh, Professor Kaplan and not the voice, of the, 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 the voice of Darth Vader. I was very much scared of the prospect of Darth Vader being part of this panel, so I'm much calmer now. Yes, uh, okay, today I would like to talk about my research project dealing with the weaponization of uh, wildlife by terrorists. Like most of my research projects, these two had a strange beginning somewhere in the distant past. It all started in a little house filled to the brim with uh, poisonous snakes from all over the world. So here I was, a brand new ranger, the sworn defender of every creepy creation of Mother Nature, scared to death by the dozens of snakes swirling on the floor around us. How many snakes were there? I still don't know. There was no one left to tell. The owner of this illegal zoo, bitten by one of his pet snakes, died on his way to the hospital. Even worse, some of the snakes decided to take a leisurely walk in the garden, the park and the street. In the coming month, we were repeatedly called back to that small community to catch yet another vicious snake. So this is what was, this is my personal story, my I was there story. It was my baptism of fire with the rangers. Soon it was followed by other weird cases, such as chasing an escaped crocodile on the highway, capturing hyenas and neutralizing other menacing water buffaloes. Uh, at some point, the absurdity of all this hit me hard. I mean, really hard. Here on the threshold of the sixth extinction, I'm more busy with saving humans from wildlife than the other way around. Something must be uh, amiss here. During the last 100 years, wildlife all but disappeared from our horizons as a threat vector. For the first time in human history, we are generally more concerned about defending wildlife from humans than the other way around. Then came the COVID crisis. And the current uh, health crisis demonstrated that any contact between wildlife and humans can generate some unpleasantries, to put it mildly. Uh, we, we no longer fear nature and one may, we, we will regret it. Due to several converging global trends, the danger posed to humans by wildlife is not decreasing, but it, it is actually increasing from year to year. In the United States alone, about 50,000 animal attacks are registered every single year. Now, these attacks are not limited to the great outdoors because, our, because of the, the abundance of the, of the food that we throw away and our poor sanitation standards, uh, wild animals are becoming increasingly city dwellers or suburbanites. So these attacks happen increasingly inside, inside the cities. In today's highly urbanized and congested world, the point, of, the point where the path of dangerous wildlife and large human crowds intersect is not even the city, but the zoo. The zoo. The purpose of my lecture is to argue that despite their connotation, as places of leisure and joy, zoos are the perfect, I mean the perfect target for terrorists. Why are they the perfect target? Because they bring together everything a prospective terrorist may wish for. A soft target, large human crowds, and the force multiplier of dangerous wildlife capable of causing disruption and death. Now, you may ask me, how did I came to this strange idea? How many terrorist incidents were perpetrated in the past by weaponized wildlife? Now, that's a good question, an even better put down. And my answer to this put down is very simple. How many skyscrapers were destroyed by the means of box cutters before 9-11? Not that much, I think. Uh, I think that the crux of the matter is to pose these questions before the incident. We may call it strategic foresight. 
posing them after the incident has another name. It is called historiography. I firmly believe that terrorism is innovation and strategic surprises in this never-ending war with terrorism are usually not failures at our kinetic, at our operational level. These are failures of our imagination. These are failures of our imagination to imagine the unthinkable. Okay. Now, now perhaps you will ask me, what are the stati uh, statistical odds of this ever happening? Okay, let's see the numbers. The question is, how many zoos are out there? There are over 10,000 registered zoos and animal parks over the world. That makes for an average of about 50 potential targets per country. Not a small number by any standards. And these 10,000 zoos register annually more than 7 million visitors. What is 7 million? It is about the, twice the population, the population of the United States of America. The next question that you may ask me is whether terrorists did consider in the past Zeus and as worthwhile targets. And the answer is yes, of course, very much. According to the GDT and RAND terrorism databases, between 1994 and 2016, seven attacks were reported on zoos in five different countries. You can see the map of the world. Most of these cases happened in Sri Lanka and India and the other in other continents. So it is, uh, uh, not, it's not an uncommon, an unknown phenomenon. And the last question that you perhaps may wish to ask me is, is dangerous wildlife, well, that dangerous? Now, that's, this is a difficult question to, uh, to, to answer because it depends on the context. But as, a, as an indirect indicator, you may wish to consider the following figures. Between 1992 and 2012, there were over 500 cases of captive animal attacks in U.S. zoos alone. You can see the pie chart, about a third of these were perpetrated by, by big cats. An another group was uh, uh, perpetrated by, by bears, grizzly bears and polar bears. How fatal were these attacks? Taking the numbers of the U.S.-based Humane Society, uh, most, about 90% of the attacks by captive predators are fatal to humans. These are deadly attacks. To put things into perspective, I have looked up the statistics of New York NYPD, the New York Police Department. And according to their figures, about two thirds of the, of the people shot by a firearm actually survive. So the conclusion is that dangerous wildlife is way, way more dangerous than firearms. Okay. So these are, these are the statistics. From the data presented, we may draw the following conclusions. First, zoos are everywhere. They are ubiquitous, soft targets. Two, zoos were repeatedly targeted by terrorists in the past, and we have every, absolutely every basis of assuming that it will happen in the future. Third, the dangerous wildlife inside these zoos is a lethal weapon. Okay, so what remains is to take these dots and to connect them and to, and to consider the implications. Let's see what the implications are. But before this, I would like to, to uh, add a few remarks about the uh, risk mitigation measures by the various zoos. Okay, what the zoos are doing in order to re reduce, to mitigate these dangers. Okay, now, in order to answer this question, I will turn to three different, three different sources. The first type is a regulatory and doctrinal material published by governments and the International Association of Zoos and Aquariums. The second is the safety and security policies of several select zoos that I have been working with in the past. Third is my personal experience in auditing these physical security policies. So let's see what we have there. The strat landscape emerging from these documents is, contains several distinctions. 
there is a distinction between safety and security. There is another one between animal threats and human threats. And finally, there is a distinction between crime, wildlife theft, for instance, and terrorism inside those. These are the main distinctions. What is very, very puzzling for me, at least, is the huge variance in the attention bandwidth lavished by the different bodies on the issues of security in general and terrorism in particular. Okay, it, the, the saying goes that professionals think the same, but in this case it is untrue. Okay, it is a spectrum. Okay, and at one end of the spectrum we will find the United Kingdom's Department of Environment's Standards of Modern Zoo Practice. Now, this good document has little or, or almost nothing to say about security, let alone terrorism. At the other end of the spectrum, we will find the doctrinal material published by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. This is a much better document, and this is, a, this is good news, because uh, most of the zoos around the world use this document as the basis for their contingency planning. And this document contains a a, a, a analysis of different threat vectors, both animal and humans. This is the good news. The bad news is that there are still very much, uh, uh, there, there are still many lacunae, uh, shortcomings in this document. And I would like to, to talk about these shortcomings. What are these? First and foremost, the analysis uh, of the physical threat landscape of this document, this doctrinal document is limited to two scenarios only, either bombing or active shooter. If you are not one of these, you should not apply. Okay, so uh, it, it is obviously a, 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 a incomplete document because there are so, so, so much more uh, th threat scenarios uh, uh, over these two. The second a main shortcoming that I find very intriguing is that it completely ignores the cyber threat landscape. Now, even if you don't mind your information, in an age of IP-based security systems and SCADA-controlled access systems, cyber problems will very, cyber threats will very soon turn into physical threats. So this is a very significant shortcoming. Third. The document fails to connect animal threats and human threats into synergistic scenarios in which a human attacker uses both kinetic and cyber attacks in order to generate massive force multiplier by, by the exploitation of the wildlife inside the zoos. Fourth, the document fails to envision social engineering, social engineering exploits, such as the infiltration of the zoo's operational zones and the sabotaging of critical equipment or hijacking of critical equipment, such as access and safety controls. Fifth, the document fails to consider the impact of what's happening inside the zoo over the environment of the zoo, the residential areas, the cities in which the zoo is situated. So these are the five shortcomings, and this is my this is the theoretical part of my of my lecture. Let's go a little more practical and uh, take a look at how such a synergistic threat scenario of terrorism by, by wildlife may unfold. Let's see such a scenario. A terrorist group decides to cause maximum havoc in a target city by using minimal resources. We know that terrorists live, uh, terrorists live on a budget too. So the modus operandi chosen by them will be a kinetic attack on a crowded zoo, augmented by the unleashing of dangerous wildlife, wildlife both on the zoo's visitors and its immediate surroundings. And you can see this uh, chart depicting the, the, vari the various circles in which the attack will unfold. The first phase of the attack, in all likelihood, will be a silent one, perhaps an a long one of long duration, and based on a combination of social engineering and cyber exploits. Its objective will be to hijack and to degrade 
or destroy the access control and safety systems in place, just like alarms, security cameras, uh, the controls, the SCADA controls of the gates, these things. The second phase will be a kinetic attack on critical safety structures, such, such as those glass walls and fences, protecting the visitors from the dangerous wildlife. These are built to resist animal muscle and have absolutely no chance against breaching charges or rocket-propelled grenades. Terrorists may consider additional pyrotechnics in order to drive the captive animals out of their dens and into the crowds. The third phase will be on the main kinetic attack by small arms and explosives aimed at the crowds in the zoo. Okay, and the fifth, the, the fourth and the final uh, phase will be a, another kinetic attack, this time by explosives or vehicle ramming against the perimeter fence of the zoo, opening the way before dangerous wildlife into the city, into the surrounding residential areas. Just imagine Budapest, for instance, with the wonderful residential area surrounding the zoo and uh, how such a scenario will unfold there. Now, while the last phase may sound a little far-fetched, there were actually several mass escapes of dangerous animals from zoos in the last decade alone. In 2011, about uh, about 50 big cats and other dangerous animals escaped from a Zansville, Ohio animal park. You can see the pictures after they were neutralized, it breaks the heart. In 2018, three big cats ex escaped from the Lünebach, Germany Lünebach Eiffel Zoo. These two events generated much public angst and media attention, despite the fact that they were swiftly contained. Now, these Two, two events were completely dwarfed by, by an outlandish, an absolutely outlandish 2015 escape of hundreds, literally hundreds of wild animals from the Tbilisi Zoo follow, following a catastrophic flooding of the city. You can see the pictures of hippos on the streets and, uh, and uh, uh, predators hunting dogs and it was havoc, complete havoc. The event impacted a huge area, tens of kilometers around the city and it took several days before it was finally brought under control. And despite the mass deployment of local armed forces and foreign volunteers, the number of casualties was very, very significant. So this Tbilisi attack should be a, a real wake-up call that these things can actually happen. Okay, this is the scenario. Uh, I will close my presentation by uh, considering uh, a few ways in which uh, our zoos and the communities around them can be made safer. First, I, I, I agree with you that zoos can hardly be defined by the existing EU definitions as, as critical infrastructures. They are not. However, however, a synergistic attack on a major zoo may well, may well generate uh, effects on a magnitude similar to a, an attack on a real, real critical infrastructure. Such an attack may carry economic, environmental, public health, psychological and political effects of great, very great severity over a significant area. In order to mitigate these risks, these risks the following measures should be adopted. Security policies. Now, security policies are, are the main tools of, of trade. It tell, they tell us how to defend these, uh, uh, these zoos. Now, these security policies, both cyber and physical, should be upgraded by a voluntary, I repeat, voluntary compliance to the existing critical infrastructure standards. The threat landscape. The threat landscape should be broadened in order to include more scenarios especially a synergistic ones bringing together kinetic and cyber, human and animal dangers. We should also perhaps consider a, a scenarios such, such as biological warfare attacks. We can think about zoos as micro-ecological launching grounds for such an attack 
by replicating the conditions of the Wuhan wet market. What can happen in a wet market, it can surely happen in a zoo too. Perhaps we should consider this. Technology. Technology is replacing humans in the zoos too. And these technologies and their control systems must be hardened to critical infrastructure standards. The human element. The human element is the weakest link in the chain as we know. So the workforce in the zoos should be properly wetted, supervised, tested and retested. As about the existing security elements, every zoo has a, a, a emergency response team. Now these teams has to be reconceptualized. They have, have to be redesigned in a more tactical, according to a more tactical mindset. Because the local law, law enforcement has tools that are not that are irrelevant to containing dangerous wildlife. In simple terms, they cannot shoot elephants with what they have. The first line of defense we have, the emergency, emergency response teams of the zoos, may be our last, our last line of defense. And last but not least, training and wargaming in the zoos should move our cheese. It should be based on the worst case rather than on the best case scenarios. Okay, so these are the measures. And uh, as a closing remark, I, I would like to add that Finally, and above all, we as security professionals should use our imaginations as the essential pieces of our toolbox. We will not, we will not defeat terrorists only by being ahead of them in the decision action loop. We must be ahead of them in the creativity loop too. In the creativity loop too. So this is my call to action. And uh, I think that by the strange paradoxes of human conflicts, the only way to preserve our zoos as places of leisure and joy, the only way is to reimagine them, reimagine them as battlegrounds. Thank you very much and thanks for your attention.